All right. I think that in a moment, we're going to be live on Facebook. Um, it says now playing. So here we go. Welcome to uh, our writing police procedure and right. getting it right. Tonight, I've got a great lineup of authors who are all writing police procedure. And I'm going to introduce them one at a time since we're, we have a limited time and so much to talk about. Um, I'd like to start with Jeff Nania, and Jeff writes the John Cabrelli series of the Northern Lakes Mysteries. How's it going, Jeff? Going well. How's it going with you, Tracy? Good. Um, and, and I wanted to start with you because I know that you were uh, working in law, law enforcement, enforcement before um, you, you began writing fiction about it. So... Um, my first question is for you, and, and I want to know, is there a common police procedural problem that you see in books that you try to avoid in your own writing? Uh, yeah, there is. One of the, in police procedure, um, I try to make certain that I am following all of the rules that a law enforcement officer has to follow. Um, and that includes protecting people's constitutional rights, uh, things regarding probable cause, reason to believe. These are technical terms that are used every day in law enforcement. So in, some, in a couple of my books, the procedural part of law enforcement has been an important part. Law enforcement changes is changing right now at warp speed things that are, were commonplace 25 years ago are non-existent now. Things that'll be commonplace a year from now, we don't even know about. And it's important that we get these details technically correct. Um, for example, um, DNA testing. So on TV, they test and immediately the DNA comes back and you've got the suspect. In Wisconsin right now, and I checked with the medical examiner's office today, it's about four and a half or five weeks. And that's if it's a felony. Um, backlog on DNA on sexual assault kits is about 6,000 in Wisconsin right now. And so I wanna respect all those things, but I wanna make certain that I'm making a case. If, if even John Cabrelli, if he's arresting a bad guy, he's gotta play by the rules. And um, that's what I try to do. And I follow those procedures to do that. And in order to make that happen, I am lucky that I have all sorts of people who are glad to comment on anything that I say and uh, glad to help me out. Um, so, and that's what I, so that's pretty much what I believe in is following those procedures. Yeah, well, and I'm sure that you were taught strict procedures as a police officer. And, and so it's important, though, to keep up with the new, the new scientific standards and how fast things are moving, like you said. Um, would anybody else like to talk about that a little bit? Go right ahead. The rape kit back, backlog in Idaho right now is 18 months. 18 months in Idaho right now. You know, and Lori, I can't even begin to tell you how foolish that is. So let me put this in a real law enforcement perspective. 6,000 rape kits are out there waiting to be tested. I'll take a call of a sexual assault and I'll do a report and all that. And, um, There'll be another one a week later or a month later. And we're looking for different suspects at that point until those kits come back and we realize, no, we don't have different suspects. We have one person or, and doing several things. And that's how, and how, you know, instead of looking for a dozen different people, now you're looking for one to concentrate your manpower and far more effective. You know, I don't even know how we got so screwed up on these DNA, DNA kits. I, I just don't know. So, Jeff, what do you think about um, the idea of 
implementing artificial intelligence like they're talking about to to process those the backlog what's your opinion on that as a police officer um it's a so tough one i know <laughs> it is a tough it is a tough one and one of the reasons is um everything that becomes part of evidence has to go to court. It goes in front of a human being, whether it's processed in a lab, whether it's mechanically processed or it's processed by a person, everything has to. The big argument right now using artificial intelligence is facial recognition technology. Mm -hmm. It's a big thing. I got to see a sample of um, how that works, it is a blur. It's and, fast, pretty hmm? incredible. Oh, it's, it's incredible. Is it accurate? And what happens? Does, should we allow this to go through this computer process where they spit out this identification, this picture? And what if it's not right? So at some point we've got to find a way to mix the human beings in guest investigative good sense, criminal procedure and technology. What do you right. think about it? What do you what think? What do I think? Yeah. I, I, the, the, the thing I have a problem with automation, I, yes, it doesn't need a lunch breaks, vacation time, it can work 24 seven and probably spit out a lot of good information. But I worry about uh, devaluing human labor you know, um, it, I think we're going to have to strike a balance, even in law enforcement, for um, allowing people to be able to do their jobs because they like their jobs, and also being able to somehow smooth out this wrinkle with all these backlogs, which are like everyone has said today, it's it's kind of uh, unforgivable. So that's my opinion. I think we're going to have to reach a happy medium if that's possible. There's a, an accuracy factor too. I'm thinking in London, England alone, and just in London, there are 5 million ca cameras and there are many more throughout England. And, you know, they're all taking pictures of people, but how accurate are they really? There've been some, you know, really bad mistakes. You're right. There mm -hmm. have been some bad mistakes. And it... Uh... You know, facial recognition technology is a composite. It, it and so they they did when they were showing us the tech, they did my face, and um, you know it was pretty amazing. But and now they've got you. <laughs> now they are. They've had me for so long. They can have me. And now they've got you. <laughs> I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, uh, Sheila Lowe is the author of um, the Claudia Rose series books, and, and you write about forensic handwriting analysis. Yes. Um, so my question for you is, how does your non-law law enforcement character manage the law enforcement aspects of your story? All right. Well, I do work in the court system as a forensic document examiner, but of course, that doesn't make me like a cop or, you know, well, a cop or a, or a private investigator. So my character who does the same kind of work that I do has a, first a boyfriend, then a fiance, now a husband who is an LAPD detective, a homicide detective. And so, you know, some of, some of the stories go through him and in two of the books, in um, Outside the Lines and in Ink Slinger's Ball, a lot of the books are from his point of view. Joel, I gave him a really hard name for people to pronounce <laughs> for his last name, and it's Jovanic. And so some of those are from his point of view. Um, and to, to be able to get the information correct, because it's really important to me to be correct to do things the right way in, especially in fields that are not necessarily my own. Um, 
because of the handwriting stuff I know and I can do that accurately. But I took a course, um, a two or three day in-person course several years ago with Derek um, Pacifico and have since had some terrific consultations with him. I always run the police procedure stuff by him first and he gives me great ideas. And then when there's FBI stuff, I go to George Fong and he's been really generous and wonderful. And there are other police people that I talk to. So I think for me, the important thing is you don't wanna put all of the details on the page, but it is important enough you know, for, for, for the author to know what the details are so you know what you need in and what to leave out. Right. I think it's important to add, you know, specific details enough to, to, you know, let the reader know that you're honest and, and you're, you know, you've done your research, but exactly. not enough to interrupt the flow of the story. Yeah. It's not like, you know, my platform is handwriting examination and people are always saying, well, I want more, let's see more handwriting analysis. But my answer is this is not a book about handwriting analysis. If you wanna know about that, you can read my nonfiction books about handwriting, but it would be the same with the police procedure. We're not trying to write a, a police procedure manual, right. but we need, you know, we need the stuff that's really important and, and accurate. Right. Would anyone else like to weigh in on that, Sarah Lynn? Well, I think Sheila really hit the nail on the head about accuracy. I think we're all striving to have authenticity in our work because any of our readers might be more expert than we are in the methodology and, and the um, technology of police procedures. So we need to be as accurate as we can possible, possibly be. And that means having resources at our fingertips to consult with who, who themselves have, are expert and who are current in their profession. Because as Jeff mentioned, the profession is constantly changing because technology and data gathering is completely, you know, it's changing at warp speed, as Jeff said. So I, I think Sheila's right. And I've been fortunate too, to have a, a number of wonderful sources who tell me things like with DNA, when we were talking about that, um, it's, it's very expensive to run a DNA test. So you can't just run random DNA tests. You can't run tons of them. You need to know exactly where you think your DNA has shown up because you don't wanna waste the resources of the police department, you know, testing here and testing there, and it might not even be there. So um, those are the kinds of things that I wouldn't know if I didn't have really good sources to back me up. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Margaret Mizushima is the author of the Timber Creek Canine Mystery Series. And my question for you, Margaret, is um, what life experiences have you had that help with writing police procedures? Well, since I have never been a law enforcement officer, I have to rely heavily on um, my consultants. And uh, just like uh, everyone else is talking here, um, I've, I've developed people that helped me out with both police procedure and canine handling. But one of the life uh, experiences I had that's just been invaluable was about 30 years ago, my husband and I took two of our dogs into our Larimer County, Colorado um, group search and rescue training. And so we had that experience of actually teaching dogs the nose work for tracking and trailing. And 
<laughs> you know, 30 years ago, I had no idea I would be trying to write canine mysteries uh, by the time I retired from my other career. And so this has just been an invaluable experience for me to have had that. And then, of course, um, I have two pro protagonists in my book. One is a deputy sheriff who's a canine handler, and the other one is a veterinarian. And so I do try to put some work that my vet character has to do in the books that tie into the mystery um, in every book. And Luckily, I've been married to a veterinarian for about 40 years now. So I have watched him work very often. And so that life experience has really helped. But I did wanna tell a little story about getting police procedure right as a non-law enforcement officer. In my fourth book, Burning Ridge, I start, I open with a scene where Deputy Maddie Cobb um, gets involved with trying to stop a bar fight. And in doing so, she kind of wades into the melee with her baton. So I typically write these scenes and use my imagination and just go anywhere I want. And then I send them to my, uh, my nephew, who's a law enforcement officer, and he reads them for me. And he sends me back a me an email that said, I hate to tell you this, but you have Maddie committing about three felonies. Here. <laughs> <laughs> so I just can't stress enough that we who have not done the job really need to pay attention to our consultants. Can I add something to what I said? Because I don't think I was clear. Um, and I hope I said Derek Pacifico because I always get him mixed up with Dennis Palumbo, who's a wonderful writer. But Derek, Derek Pacifico was um, a police chief and he's been a detective and he's big in law enforcement. So I just wanted to make that clear. I mean, that's why I was consulting with him. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You mentioned that, um, you know, it is not just non-law enforcement officers or former law enforcement officers that get procedural things wrong. Two years ago, I read a book that was written by a friend of mine who was a detective, had about 30 years on the department, 20 years as a detective. And for the sake of the story and to move it along and to try and get through this procedural thing, he speeded things up and he removed parts of what he would have done in real life. Hmm. And um, I thought it was very interesting. I, I told him, I, that I said, so the guy is gonna walk. You might as well save your breath because you haven't done. And it, so here was a law enforcement, a very experienced top investigator, just trying to get the story to move right along. But too much maybe, right? That's interesting. Yeah, you have to find ways of compressing some of that stuff because you can't you can't do everything, but you got to keep, as I said before, you got to keep the important stuff. But but you can find ways to compress it in the book, even if you do it, but you skip some time. Right, right. You just say that it was done. Yeah. Um, Laura, if you're on mute. Nope. Lori Buchanan is the debut author of the um, Sean McPherson books. And so Lori, I have a question for you. Um, do you enlist the help of professionals of, in law enforcement or medical examiners or private investigators when you're writing your procedurals? Absolutely. And one of the perks of being a member of the Idaho Writers Guild is being able to attend the monthly Mystery Writers Academy. And every month we have a professional. So I'm going to list a couple of the types of professionals that we've had whose input has been amazingly precious and valuable. So we've had um, a detective in the major crimes unit of the Idaho State Police. We've had a DNA specialist at the Idaho State Police Crime Lab. 
We've had a forensic pathologist. We've had a private investigator. I'll actually name him because he's also an author. Danny Smith is also the author of the Dickie Floyd detective novels. We've had um, a forensic psychiatrist who talks deeply with us about the difference between sociopaths and psychopaths. We've had a psychologist who talked with us deeply about the difference between clinical psychology and forensic psychology. They're deeply different. We've had a photojournalist and a crime reporter. We had a US Army officer who was an Iraq and an Afghanistan veteran who talked with us about armor. He's an armor specialist. So for those people who need to write about that type of thing, we had the um, a lieutenant in the Idaho Department of Corrections talk with us specifically about with the Women's Correctional Center here in Idaho. And we're not talking about soft little, um, maybe they stole some lipstick. We're talking about full on cold-blooded murder. They, these are a, a high security for women, women only. That's how big the state of Idaho is now, a women only prison. We've had the Idaho State Fire Marshal who talked with us about arson, accelerants, and uh, pyromania. We've had the uh, Ada County Medical Examiner and Coroner's Office come in and talk with us about the difference between a medical examiner and a coroner's office. And here in Idaho, we have both because they're, they're vastly different. In the city, we have an ME, medical examiner in the cities, and we have a ton of rural areas in Idaho, a ton of rural areas. We have meth labs everywhere in the mountains. And so we have coroners there. I mean, uh, yeah, coroners there. Um, so wait, have, this isn't just one conference. This is a- Oh no, this is monthly. Every month. month we have a specialist come in and we get to sit and talk with them. And then if we want, if we can get on their calendar personally, we can also do that. And I always try to take advantage of that. We've talked with 911, the people who answer the 911 calls, the dispatchers. We, I got resource. to speak with the chief public defender um, and, and his take on uh, not being a prosecutor, but being a defender and why that's important. Because you would think, oh, you know, go after them. And, and he's, uh, he's, the, he's the one that uh, defends people on death row in the state of Idaho. It's interesting. Um, How can we, we sign up for your I Idaho? Know, I know, I <laughs> know. It's amazing. We've had the professor who leads the BSU, Boise State University Forensic Justice Program. We got to talk to a U.S. Marshal when nobody else can handle it. They call in a U.S. Marshal. Oh my gosh, they kick butt and take names. Oh my gosh. They yeah. move criminals from this facility to this facility. The US Marshals are also responsible for protecting the people, the judges, the, the, the people in the justice system. And then we've also had a criminalist with the NAMPA, which is close to Boise uh, Police Department. So yes, I get to talk with them. And again, we get to talk with them as a group of writers. And then we can also try to get on their calendar individually, which I always take advantage of. And I use that information down to the Nats whisker. Yeah. Yeah, we, we have a lot of those kinds of people at uh, the Mystery Writers of America chapter in LA. And it's always so instructive and they have the most interesting stories. We had one, before the pandemic, obviously, one of the last ones where they had somebody uh, on child trafficking and walked us through a whole case. And it was just horrifying what happened to this 13 year old girl and how she was groomed over the internet. And, you know, yeah, we, we um, are lucky to have those kinds of resources. Wow. Yeah, the, I was going to say the the one conference that I know I've been to a few times is the Sisters in Crime and Mystery Writers America, um, the uh, Police Academy for Writers, and and so that's been an awesome resource for me. It was being held up in Appleton, Wisconsin, for a little while, so I was like, wow, that's in my backyard. I'm going, <laughs> you know. Yes. Yeah. So uh, Lori Stevens. Um, Lori Stevens writes the Gabriel McRae series, and um, and I, my question for you is, what's the funniest or strangest experience that you've had in regard to the research for your police procedure? Well, like uh, Sheila had pointed out earlier, and actually what everyone's been pointing out, research is so important, right? 
we all have to uh, make sure that what we put in is factual, but then we don't want to make it re read like some data information book. Um, I was lucky that my niece was a, a forensic anthropologist and she worked for the LA County coroner for a while. So I got a lot of information from her. Um, then she went off to something else. But when I first was doing this book, the first one, The Dark Before Dawn, um, I wanted to get my police procedure right. I knew that I was working with a uh, LA County Sheriff, different from LAPD, different from the city. They serve the outlying areas of the Los Angeles, um, the suburbs, things like that. So one of the things I did was I marched over to the Malibu substation and it's part of the LA County Sheriff's Department. And I met a guy named Sergeant Dan Taylor, he gave me his card and he took me through and he showed me the cubicles of the detectives. He showed me the drunk tank and, and uh, I won't go into details about that, but why it's made the certain way with a big drain in the center. And so I had this wonderful uh, tour from him and, you know, I wrote a couple different drafts. It took a while. I finally got the book published and I put his name right in the acknowledgement page, Sergeant Dan Taylor, there it is. And I marched right in with my book to give him a thank you copy. And the people at the desk said, uh, we don't have a Sergeant Dan Taylor. And I said, well, can you check your database because maybe he got transferred or left. And they looked and they said, We've never had a Sergeant Dan Taylor. They say, go back and check his card. And I know that I, I remember seeing his card. I remembered the insignia. And I went back, I couldn't find the card. So I thought, I think I've either gone insane, but then who showed me the drunk tank? I wouldn't have made that up. It's there. Uh, also a search and rescue, a green helicopter. I mean, someone told me and that was the weirdest thing that's ever happened so i have this guy in my acknowledgement page and um he, he actually helped me out a lot and disappeared into thin air oh that's oh. weird Ooh, uh, there's a there's a book for you right there there's a whole other mystery i don't know where sergeant dan taylor can you hear me yeah. on Facebook. <laughs> but remember what happened at the malibu substation that girl that they let go in the night you know and she disappeared never to be seen again for years until they found her bones down in the canyon. Wait, she didn't work there, did she? No, she was in a restaurant and she was acting crazy. She was having an episode and they arrested her and then they let her go in the middle of the night. Just no car, no nothing in Malibu in the canyon and just let her go and she disappeared. Well, her and da Sergeant Dan Taylor, I don't know what I'll happened. Be together. <laughs> together <yeah. laughs> oh my gosh. So that was a weird, that, that just, I have no explanation. Somebody really showed crazy. me around that doesn't exist. Oh. Oh. Well, okay, then. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah Lynn, you get to follow up with that story. Sarah Lynn uh, Richard is the author of the Detective Parrot Mysteries. Yes. And my question for Sarah Lynn is, um, how do the current challenges in law enforcement play into your stories? Well, I, I have Detective Parrot, and he's young and very idealistic. Um, he, this is his first year in, when, in Murder in the 1%. He's a rookie detective. And the book starts when he has... Um, personal tragedy occur. His cousin, whom he's very close to, has been shot by police in, um, as a, he was an innocent bystander. And his cousin was shot and killed. And, and I think in addition to all the things we've been talking about, about the technology and the procedures of police procedurals, um, we also need to think about the psyches of our characters and what it must be like to be a policeman in times like this, where um, things change uh, politically for policemen. And sometimes uh, 
sometimes it's hard for a policeman to do his work and and have a feeling of self-efficacy when the news media and and the politicians are you know screaming against police or are wanting to defund police and i know as an educator when teachers came under you know were thrown under the bus how difficult that was and i i know that it must be difficult for policemen too so um whatever is going on in current times i think our characters also have to suffer with those things and struggle with those things and and overcome them in order to do their best jobs their, do their best work and live their best lives as in that profession and that's what i try to have parrot do uh, a lot of this black lives matter um it it's affecting Parrot. He's whispering in my ear and he's telling me a lot of things about how hard this is for him. So I'm, I'm starting a new Parrot book now. It's the third one. And that will definitely be as much of a part of it as everything else. And I will research that as well. I'm not going to just make it up. I'm going to be talking to my sources to make sure that that's psychologically sound also. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important to stay current. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would anyone else like to weigh in on that? That's um, just like, oh, go ahead, Jeff. No, go ahead. I'd rather listen to you than me. <laughs> well, I, I'll be very brief. Um, just like Lori's uh, and Sheila's chapters, we, we do have those types of presentations with our chapter here in the Rocky Mountain region as well. And um, just this past month, we had um, Sergeant Amy Wheeler talk to us about this very thing. Um, and she, her, her topic was uh, uh, basically the procedures that happen after an officer involved shooting. And um, yes, the, the psychological aspects of that and also the studies that have come down on how memory is affected by stress. And so you, you gotta realize these law enforcement officers are under a huge amount of stress when the bullets are flying. And so all of these factors come into play. Um, there's a, a good, uh, YouTube channel for Rocky Mountain Mystery Writers of America that's accessed through our website, rmmwa.org. And um, it's open to non-members. So if anybody wants to write, watch that, uh, that recording, you're welcome to. Yeah. yeah you know, I, I, I'd like to say this. So I hope that and in, in my books, I try very hard to look at the way law enforcement is. Things are going to change. You're going to determine how they change. Writers have a big hand in this. Um, you mentioned police-involved shootings. In my first book, there is, we have a police-involved shooting. First of all, you know that police officers never recover from those events. They never go away. If they do go away, they're in the wrong job. And so we take a lot of responsibility in, and we look at these things. I don't think law enforcement officers want to victimize people, but I do think that they're, my daughter's very involved. She's a forensic social worker. She was a law enforcement officer and she works with an online situation on the line not online online where a police officer gets to a call and has she has to talk somebody down or something like that police officers aren't necessarily trained to do that and because of the structure of call law enforcement they don't have time so this is a huge change and she talks to people and you know they're she just had one that was a suicide by cop thing where um, she just 
talk to them. And that's where we're going to be heading in law enforcement. And that's where we should, should be heading. I mean, bear something else in mind. You know, these kids that are, um, their parents are arrested and they end up being taken into uh, social services and custody. You know, statistically, those kids, once they're institutionalized, once they're there for the rest of their lives, forevermore. And we have to do something and work on structuring that. And these are law enforcement people who are trying very hard to work with trained professionals to make some changes. I'm, um, you know, if you're, if where you live ever gets, what they're doing is um, you can sign up to be a temporary social worker, a temporary placement, uh, and you just go through being vetted and everything, and they call you at three o'clock in the morning and say, Lori, we have two kids who need a safe place to stay tonight. Can you keep them for a couple of days? And while we sort this out, so you aren't throwing them in a foster home or temporary foster home, you throw them in a good environment and um, it's works, it's remarkable. Not to, I don't wanna bring all that up, but it's very important. And this is all the changes in law enforcement. Um, you know. Psychology is a big part of it. I mean, psychology is something that I study more too, that, um, that, you know, these, the law enforcement officers, I think are going through lots of trauma and, um, and it's really important that they're supported in a really good way. It also is important that they don't misbehave. It's also important that they don't abuse their authority. Yes. It's important that they act responsibly if they expect the public to support them. Yeah. You know, it's, it's very interesting because you're, you're dealing with human beings that are in a, in a position of high intensity and fear and stress, and it's getting more and more where they, they are expected to have the, the, the body cams and everything and, and to follow procedure so carefully, but it's, it, it's, it's hard to almost be a machine, you know, where you, you're, you're there in fear for their life possibly. Uh, they're trying to remember their training. I think it's got to be very, very tough. My character in my book is, is under a lot of therapy. At first it's mandatory and then it's voluntary um, to not only cope with his own childhood stuff, but the stuff that he hits day to day. So I think it's important to consider that even with police procedural novels, as you consider the, the humans behind it. Well, and to your point, Lori, the, as human beings, different than artificial intelligence, we also have this wonderful thing that we've been gifted with called gut instinct, and it's mm -hmm. there to keep us alive. And sometimes our gut instinct might be a little bit different than A, B, C, D, E, F, G, dot your I's, cross your T's. And, you know, that's all this stuff going on in their mind at the same time. Here's the rules and regulations. Here's my gut instinct. What do I do? What do I do? And, and boy, you know, they're, they're right on they're trained the, to react. Exactly. And, you know, there's a cutting edge and there's a bleeding mm -hmm. edge. And I think law enforcement are on the bleeding edge so much of the time, so much of the time. Right. And then you have, you know, that, but then people play Monday morning quarterback the next, the, in review. And it's, it's very easy, I think, also to point the finger and say, look what you did wrong here. Look what you did wrong there. Um, I don't know. I think that's what we writers do. We, we, we place the, the people, real people, well, into right. us. <laughs> uh, uh, in, in perilous situation where the reader then can go, I don't know, what would I have done in that point, given all those sets of circumstances happening lightning fast? Right. Right. It's a difficult situation. Well, I have more questions to discuss with all of you. And I wanted just to ask um, how much forensic detail is needed to give veracity to your story? I love forensics. I mean, it's one of my, 
I, I was having a field day when my niece went into that field. Um, she actually thought it was too much, you know, for her. Uh, she, she got tired of seeing, you know, being in the uh, autopsy rooms. But um, I, I like the forensics and I like psychiatric forensics. And um, I don't know, I think, I think it adds so much richness to your story rather than just gloss over something. If you can even almost teach someone, this is how it is, but you do it in a nice, you know, in, a, in an entertaining way. I think it adds so much. It just enriches your book so much. I, I absolutely, I mean, I mean, Lori's going to jump on Lori and continue <laughs> and say that, you know, one of the, one of the uh, areas that's really interesting to me is the difference between blood splatter and blood spray. And they can tell, is that from a vein? Is that from a carotid artery? It's different. You know, some people might use the term interchangeably and they are oh 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 so different and when we when we can say there was splatter or sp or spray and 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 how how they can tell you know what what happened because of that what was the angle what was then what happened because of the angle of this splatter or spray i i'm like you lori i'm just absolutely fascinated with that and i don't know that artificial intelligence can have that same um, engagement. It's just boom, 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 um, and good or bad. But I'm tremendously engaged by, by detail like that. We might remember that when we talk about forensics, what forensics means is something that's used in court. It's the, it's the court part of it. So I've testified in about 70 cases. So I've got to see it from you know, the standpoint of a witness sitting in the witness chair. Well, I got to tell you, a couple of weeks ago, I testified for the, the first time since the pandemic in, the, in person. I've done some online. But when I entered the courtroom, fully masked, of course, and they had only the people that had to be there, they didn't have me sit in the witness stand. They put me in the front row of the jury box with a microphone so that I would be far away from the judge. And I'm wondering... And may, I don't know if you want to address this now or some other time, but I'm just wondering if any of you are going to write the pandemic into uh, your books. I'm not planning to. No, I'm not planning to. It's enough living it, right? <laughs> yeah. People 10 years from now will write about the pandemic. Yeah. Yes. yes. I agree. I think it's important to write the pass like as if it was over you know and and see like the results of that like some people maybe still be wearing masks or um you know just little details it doesn't have to be like in your face um like we are living it now <laughs> it could be some good stories you know because masks cover up so much but i also heard that um publishers don't want that uh -huh. story but I think you're right, Tracy. I think we don't know what the takeaway is, is yet from this. Um, we're sort of still writing the story as it goes. Mm -hmm. So um, when, like you said, this is in the past and we can all look back and see how it affected each of us differently. Right. Or, or I think then you'll get a spurt on for a story, possibly. Or not. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the other thing is, so who am I? Go ahead. Well, who would buy a book on COVID right now? Nobody. Who wants to read it? Yeah, if the best COVID book in the world was available to me, I'd say, I don't want to read it. <laughs> I don't, yeah. yeah. Exactly. I, I have no desire to watch the movie Contagion or mm. anything like that right now. It's like, mm, no. Actually, I had a half a dozen friends who did pull that movie up and watch it at the beginning of the pandemic. Like, why? <laughs> It was at the beginning though. Yeah. <laughs> They're sick of it by now. <laughs> we do have a question from Facebook right now. Um, uh, and this is for, well, this has to be for you, Jeff and me. If there, if we know of any um, similar groups to the Idaho group that have, um, that bring in uh, professionals um, to talk about that to writers, to talk about what we're talking about. I'm not aware. I'm not aware of any. I'm sure there are some, 
Yeah, I was going to say, I believe that um, the Midwest Sisters in Crime um, does have people that come in. Um, I would check in, you know, with the Chicagoland Sisters in Crime too. Um, and this Twin Cities chapter does. Yeah, and a lot of the other chapters too. And Mystery Writers of America is another good group because they also bring in professionals. And I think a lot of these groups now, like the rest of the world, have like opened their borders so that you can like join those, you know, you can grow, join the, you know, Florida Sisters in Crime if you like. And um, just, you know, because all of these groups have different things available. So I would think those, those are probably the, your best resources for something like that. I, I tell people when they ask me how to inter get introduced to this, I tell them to go to their local police department, sign up to be a ride along and go out on patrol for a shift to get started. Um, all of a sudden you get in the car and it is, it's a different world. Do you know if that program is still running? It is absolutely running. Okay, because I, I did sign up for it online, but it was right at the beginning, right before the pandemic started. So I, I never think, heard. Excuse me. That's okay. I think if you walk into your local police department, sheriff's department, and uh, just say, you know, I'd like to, I'm a citizen, I'd like to do a, a ride along. Uh, they have citizen police academies. Yeah. Now, um, in Dane County and Madison, they have one for the Sheriff's Department and one for MPD. Um, and a lot of people go to those, but that's kind of where I'd start. And it's looking at it from a different perspective. And um, it's fun, too. That's a great idea. Um, let's see. Um, you know that police procedures in each state and each county are different, too. Um, have any of you ever strayed from the strict procedure from of where your character is living um, just for the sake of the story? Only because my character goes rogue sometimes, and so that's a good excuse to have him. But but I would not I would not break protocol. Uh, then you can't really call it a strict police procedural, you know, but if the cop goes a little rogue that for whatever reasons, um, I think that's your excuse to stray. And my Sean McPherson has never strayed from procedure, but he has gone now in book three that I'm currently working on. We've gone to a different state. We've gone to New Orleans or Nolans, New Orleans, and I've had to check what's what can a PI from Washington State do legally there? How can he get his gun there? How what can he and what can he not do there legally? And what can he also do or not do in San Francisco? So in book three, we're traveling a little bit, and I've had to check that very, very carefully. And his hands are way more tied than they are when, when where he is normally in his, in his own stomping ground. In my new book, um, there's uh, a couple of scenes where the character, where Claudia Rose and her husband, the police detective, go to another state. They go to Tucson and they're going to visit the prison there. And so the the laws are completely different about visiting prisoners than they are here in California. And, um, you know, all of, so I had to find some uh, lawyers really in, uh, in that state and check out the website. It's amazing how much you can learn from the prison website about what goes on and, you know, their procedures. Now they're, they're doing most of the, um, and this was before the pandemic, but they're doing most of the visits on a, like an iPad or on a screen, family visits. That was interesting to me. Yeah. It has helped me a lot to have a consultant who was also um, a deputy in a very small rural um, sheriff's department here in Colorado. He worked in Meeker County, which is also mountainous because he's been able to tell me so many great stories that I can take little pieces and fold them in. Um, and then he's also been really good um, on procedure because that's 
where he worked was um, in a similar county to my fictional county, uh, Timber Creek County, Colorado. Um, it, it really does help to have that. Lori, and you were mentioning all of those people that come to your Idaho Writers Group, but your book is placed in Washington. Have you noticed any differences? Oh, yeah. And I have to make sure that I'm okay there. There are not a lot of differences. The Pacific Northwest, which is considered Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and a snippet of Montana, um, we're, we're similar but, but different. I suppose like Sheila, it's Sheila's handwriting. Some people's is similar, but it's oh so different um, depending on the loops and the, you know, the different things that she's very uh, observant of and aware of. Um, and that's true also here. So I have to be very careful when I'm writing about procedure in Washington state. Yeah, that makes sense. Lori, do you feel that you have, sorry, Tracy. Go ahead, no. Um, Lori, do you feel you have more um, room as writing from a PI standpoint as, yeah, because you get a, you get to get away with a little bit more, don't you? Right, and he's working with Rafferty and Joe Bingham, and Rafferty's an FBI, and, and Bingham is a homicide detective by the time we get to book three, so I'm very focused on book three right now. It just started chapter 20. Anyway, um, <laughs> I'm very excited, but so he he doesn't have quite the red tape that they do. So they're the three of them are very much working together to get Giorgio the Bull Gambino, who's got a trifecta of states that he's with cities and states that he's working from. And his where where the FBI's hands are tied or where the homicide detectives' hands are tied, he can kind of fly under the radar a little bit. A little, I mean, he can't you know, go rogue by any stretch of the imagination, but um, I couldn't put him back. In, I couldn't put him in the FBI because he's 38 at 37. You can't be in the FBI anymore. I had really wanted him to because his dad was in the FBI and I really wanted him to go that way, but he couldn't. And to be realistic, you cannot. Once you are 37, that's the cutoff point. And then because he has a, a, a limp, even though he's faster than many other people who run and he doesn't weigh as much as people who run and so forth as other police officers, the police don't want him back because of this, because of this injury that he has. So PI was perfect. And I'm so glad, I'm so glad that I went that route. Yeah, because sometimes what I've done is I've used the strict police procedure because they are, and if you go online and you look, at you actually bring up the document of things they have to look at and things they have to stay within all their restrictions. I've actually sort of used that in the plot to, to um, undermine him because if he steps out of bounds, it's just more dramatic action. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're closing in on the end of the hour. So I have uh, a few fun questions for a lightning round. And so the lightning round, since I want all of you to answer, you get one word. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's see. The question is, what firearm does your character use? Lori Buchanan. Glock. Lori Stevens. Red Hawk. Sarah Lynn. Glock. Margaret. Glock. Jeff. Smith and Wesson M&P 2.0. Okay, <laughs> Sheila. None. <laughs> okay. Um, have you ever been arrested, Sheila? No. Jeff. No. Sarah Lynn. No. <laughs> Margaret. No. Okay, Lori. Steven. I would. I. Oh. oh. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Lori Buchanan. Yes, I ran away from home when I was 15. I was not breaking the law. I was asleep under a picnic table, but they brought me in because they were afraid for me and they arrested me for panhandling. I was sound asleep, but they wanted me to be safe. So they put me in jail for the night. <laughs> All right. Um, has your character ever been arrested? Lori Buchanan. No. Lori Stevens. Interrogated, but not, no, not arrested. Sarah Lynn. No. Margaret. No. Jeff. Tried in the press, but never arrested. She Good left. answer. She's been threatened, but not actually arrested. 
Um, what is your favorite police procedure author, someone who gets it right? Sheila. Uh, Michael Connolly. Jeff. Um, I'm going with CJ Box. Sarah Lynn. Well, I like Michael Connolly too, but I also like Jeff. Hey, all right. Um, <laughs> this is this is good. Mar Margaret. Michael Connolly. Lori Stevens. I'd have to say Connolly. Lori Buchanan. David Baldacci. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite um, character from a police procedure book? Lori Buchanan. Uh, um uh Lark. I can't think of her last name, uh, written by John Didakis, a female. He writes from a female perspective. He's a male. Lark, Lark. I can't think of her last name. John okay. Didakis. Laurie Stevens. I can't think of her name, but it's Tess Gerritsen's. And Rizzoli. Rizzoli. Yeah, Rizzoli. Yeah, I like this. Yeah. Yeah, that was Sarah. mine. Sarah Lynn. Well, I love Harry Bosch, but I also like Margaret's character, Maddie. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Margaret. Um, you know, she's a PI, Kinsey Milholm. Super. Oh. Great. Yeah. But I but I love I love them all. Well, every every character that people have mentioned here, I love them all. Jeff. Maddie Cobb or Kate Shujack. And Sheila, you gave yours. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then, and that's it. That's all I've got. <laughs> Great. And we could say what we're doing next. Yes, absolutely. Tell us, please, Sheila. Oh, me. Oh, thank you. Um, I don't have a cover. I don't have the book yet, but here's the cover for book number eight in the Claudia Rose forensic series, Dead Letters, which, um, takes place all over the world as Claudia has to go in search of her teenage niece who has disappeared from a dig site in uh, Egypt. That sounds exciting. So? Yeah, Jeff. What am I doing next? Or, well, we know that your, your book just was released. So bow cutter. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. yeah. And, and well, what are you doing next? Well, I'm, I'm, I've got to excavate the front of the house here where the <laughs> airway fell away. Um, um, I'm, I'm going fishing muskies. I've got to give some credibility to my character who likes to fish muskies in Northern Wisconsin. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the way I'm going here. Sounds good. Margaret, what are you doing? Well, the seventh book uh, in the Timber Creek Canine Mystery Series is called Striking Range, and it comes out September 7th. And thankfully, it is finished and in the pipeline. And I am just getting started with book eight. I'm on chapter two, Lori Buchanan, and I'm so <laughs> envious of you being on chapter 20. 20. <laughs> Sarah Lynn, what are you up to? Well, I've got a, a thriller coming out, a standalone called Blood Sisters before the end of the year, but I'm starting, I'm just at the, at the very beginning of the third parrot book. So I have no idea what the title will be, but I know what the subject matter is. Can you give us a little like teaser about Blood Sisters? What's that about? Um, it's, um, no, let me, let me pass on that because... <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I'm not ready to do that yet. Okay. Lori Stevens. I'm taking a little departure from police procedures for a while, and I'm working on a young adult sci-fi, uh, which is why I was asking you so much about your opinion, Jeff, your opinion on uh, AI and all that. Um, but yeah, and uh, kudos to all the writers that are, that are working on your new book. And I love the title Blood Sisters, by the way. Good job, Sarah Lynn. Intriguing. What about you, Tracy? Well, it's Lori first, Lori Buchanan. 
Well, Indelible hit the shelves on April 6th, book one. Iconoclast comes out May 3rd. Impervious, which I'm writing right now, comes out spring 2023. And um, Iniquity comes out spring 2024. And if there is a God, and I believe there is, there will be many more after that. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Um, I'm busy releasing a, a romantic suspense under um, my pseudonym. So June 21st. June 21st. Coming right up. Coming right up. So, and you can find out more about that on my website or, um, yeah. And, and look for all of these authors on the Blackbird Writers website and on their websites. Um, we've got lots of great books coming out. I'm so excited to read all of your books. And um, this was a really great conversation, you guys. Thank, Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much Thank for being so here. Um, and if we can watch the chat like later on too and answer any questions that might come up. Um, so take a look at that after the video is done here and I'm sure that we're gonna get lots, so. Good. Great. Thanks, Thanks to everyone for coming. Yes, yeah, thank, thank you all. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.